Welcome to this presentation on invasive species and biosecurity. The aim of this presentation is to provide some background information on invasive species in Wales and introduce key biosecurity concepts. Biosecurity concerns actions that are taken to minimise the introduction, spread and establishment of invasive species. This presentation has been developed by APEM Consultancy as part of a biosecurity planning project for Natural Resources Wales. The driver behind this biosecurity planning project is the wider goal of improving the condition of protected sites and increasing biodiversity. Within the marine environment, this goal extends to reducing the introduction and spread of invasive species. The project focuses on four special areas of conservation, or SACs. These are Menai and Conwy Bay, Cardigan Bay, Pembrokeshire Marine and Carmarthen Bay and Estuaries. As part of this project, we will be visiting all four SACs to engage with stakeholders from all sectors and will be holding in-person workshops to discuss, plan and agree biosecurity measures going forward. We will also be producing species action plans and pathway action plans to guide future biosecurity planning. Firstly, what do we mean by invasive non-native species? A non-native species is a species that has been introduced by people to a new area where it would not normally be found. The majority of these non-native species do not cause any issues in their new environment. However, between 10 to 15% of these species can cause ecological and or socio-economic harm. These are known as invasive non-native species, or INS for short. So what are some examples of ecological or environmental impacts from INS? INS are counted in the top five leading causes of biodiversity loss globally. This is because they can prey on native species and can alter gene pools through hybridisation. INS can outcompete native species for resources like food and space. Some INS can alter habitats, changing the structure of the substrate and ecosystem. They can hamper habitat restoration efforts, for example in seagrass or oyster beds, and lastly, they can introduce diseases and parasites that might decimate native populations. These two photos show some of the impacts that INS can have. On the left, you can see a crab that has been heavily fouled by leathery sea squirts, among other things. Heavy fouling can decrease the ability of the fouled individual to escape predators or catch prey, ultimately reducing survival. On the right, the photo shows the shells of American slipper limpets, which have started to accumulate on this intertidal area. This is an ecologically important substrate created by the tube worm Sabellaria, which may be at risk if the slipper limpets continue to accumulate here. Moving on to the economic and social impacts of INS. INS can cause damage and disruption to public utilities and waterside infrastructure, for example by blocking pipes and clogging drains. They can disturb recreational activities and have a negative impact on tourism, for example by fouling boats. INS can impact fishing and aquaculture by, for example, preying on or outcompeting commercially important species or smothering equipment. A recent paper estimated that in the EU, 117 billion euros have been spent between 1960 and 2020 on the management and control of INS. Another recent paper has also estimated that INS cost £4 billion annually to the UK economy. These two photos illustrate some of the economic and social impacts of INS. On the left, the photo shows a buoy that has been heavily fouled in a marina. The costs of cleaning and maintaining equipment can be burdensome. On the right, the photo shows a whelk that was picked up on a commercial whelk boat that is hosting a stack of American slipper limpets. Removing the limpets can be time consuming and could result in the whelk becoming damaged, thereby reducing its sale value and impacting the fishes. So how are INS spread in the marine environment? They spread by what are termed pathways or vectors. These are physical, human-mediated means by which species are transferred from one geographic location to another. Some examples of pathways in the marine environment include the movement of vessels, like commercial ships or military vessels. 
These vessels can travel vast distances between ports, potentially transferring inns. They can be carried as biofouling on ship hulls in sea chests or other niche areas. This diagram shows some of the areas where inns can stow away. Another way inns can be spread by vessels is in ballast water. This is water that is taken up into tanks at one location to stabilise the vessel while underway and is then unloaded in another location. Ballast water can contain inns, their larvae or propagules which are then introduced into a new port and may establish and cause issues. However, this vector is addressed by the Ballast Water Convention, of which the UK is a signatory, and ballast water must be exchanged offshore in designated areas or treated by onboard treatment systems to remove or kill any organisms. Recreational activities are another pathway for the introduction and spread of inns in the marine environment. Inns can stow away on boats, for example as hull fouling, as shown in this extreme photo, or on equipment like life jackets used for water sports, or nets used for fishing and angling. Some inns that are cultured for commercial purposes may escape from aquaculture sites. Inns might also hitchhike with cultured species as stock is moved from one location to another. This is thought to be one of the ways that the American slipper limpet was introduced to the UK. Other pathways include commercial fishing, where live organisms without commercial value might be thrown overboard while underway, or through the fouling of boat hulls and equipment. Construction and development of harbours and ports can introduce and spread inns too. Pontoons may be transported from one location to another and may have fouling organisms on them. Dredging in one location and moving the material to another, for example for beach renourishment or other beneficial uses, may also spread inns, though the survival of organisms during this process is being looked at more closely. Now we'll look at the potential pathways within each of the SACs we're focusing on in this project, starting with the Menai Strait and Conwy Bay SAC. The SAC is close to busy commercial shipping lanes, as you can see in this heat map from a recent NRW report. The darkness of the pixel indicates the intensity of that pathway. Recreational boating and other recreational activities like sea rowing and stand-up paddleboarding are very popular in the SAC, with numerous clubs and centres around the coast. The straits are also a key area for oyster and mussel production. Fishing and gathering occurs throughout the SAC, passenger ferries and cruises operate out of the larger ports, and offshore wind farms may also offer a stepping stone for inns to spread into the SAC. Next, we go to Cardigan Bay SAC. Recreational activities are undertaken along the coastline from boating to paddleboarding. The heat map shows some of the areas at the coast in white, which does not necessarily mean that activity doesn't occur here, but there, there may not be available data. Many wildlife tour boats operate in Cardigan Bay. Passenger ferries and commercial vessels operate out of Fishguard, which, although outside the boundaries of the SAC, could host inns that may spread along the coast into the SAC. Potting, fishing and bait digging also occurs in the SAC. In the Pembrokeshire Marine SAC, Milford Haven plays a key role in commercial shipping with, among other things, the import and export of petrochemicals. Recreational boating, water sports and co-steering are popular all along the coast. Tourist boats take visitors on excursions to nearby islands and for sport fishing. There is also some aquaculture and shellfish production and seaweed culture within the SAC. Lastly, in the Carmarthen Bay and Estuaries SAC, recreational boating is undertaken from harbours like Tenby and from around the Gower Peninsula in Swansea Bay. Other recreational activities like water sports and fishing take place throughout the SAC and in hotspots like Saundersfoot and Pendine. Bury Inlet hosts a managed cockle harvesting area and processing is carried out in locations around the SAC. Lastly, although there is limited commercial shipping activity within the SAC itself, there is a busy channel very close by going into the Swansea area, which may pose a risk to the SAC.
We're now going to go over a few examples of marine inns that have been assessed as high priority for monitoring and management in Wales. The slipper limpet, Crepitula fornicata, is native to North America and was first recorded in the UK in 1872. It is a distinctive species, forming chains of multiple individuals with larger females on the bottom of the chain and smaller males attaching above. The slipper limpet can compete with native species for space and food and can foul shellfish, decreasing their survival. They can also alter substrates, for example, covering previously soft sediment areas with their hard shells from both dead and living individuals. In some areas, thick layers of slipper limpet shells can blanket the seabed with densities exceeding 2,000 individuals per metre squared. Populations have been found throughout Wales particularly on the southern coast by Milford Haven at Swansea and in the northwest in the Menai Straits. The next inns is the Chinese mitten crab, Eriochir sinensis, which is native to the Yellow Sea Basin in China and was first recorded in the UK in 1935. Adult mitten crabs live in freshwater environments, making their burrows in riverbanks. During their reproductive season, Adult crabs migrate downstream to brackish and saline waters to breed. Females are highly fertile, producing between 250,000 and 1 million eggs. The eggs are then brooded on the underside of the female for up to two months before they hatch. Adults will only make a single reproductive migration, though multiple broods may be produced during the reproductive season. They die once the spawning season is over. The larvae, however, remain in the water column for about one month before they settle and develop into the typical crab form. Juvenile crabs then move upstream into fresh water where they develop into adults. Their impacts include destabilising riverbanks by burrowing and being a nuisance to recreational anglers by damaging nets and stealing bait. This photo shows some of the burrow holes made in a bank. In Wales, some records have been made on the southern coast, but higher densities of sightings have been made in the north and northwest, in the Dee Estuary and Conwy Bay in particular. Next, we have the carpet sea squirt, Didinum vexillum, native to Japan. This is a colonial sea squirt comprised of multiple individuals which can grow by budding, spreading like a carpet to smother substrate as well as native flora and fauna. This includes protected species like seagrasses and artificial surfaces like marina infrastructure, fishing equipment and vessel hulls. The sea squirt is a worry for aquaculturists as it can smother aquaculture trestles, preventing water and food from getting to the commercially important species inside, for example oysters, and can cover the shellfish themselves, impacting their growth and survival. The body of the sea squirt, known as the tunic, is also acidic, which prevents other species from being able to settle and grow on it. In Wales, a population in Holyhead Harbour is present, despite efforts to eradicate it. Populations have now also been found in Milford Haven. The next high priority inns is the American lobster, Homerus americanus. Native to the Atlantic coast of North America, there have been multiple introduction events into UK waters, both accidental and deliberate. A notable event occurred in 2015 in Brighton when 361 were released in a religious ceremony. They can be difficult to identify, but they are larger and more aggressive than native lobsters. They therefore impact native lobster populations through competition, as well as interbreeding and spreading disease. The Marine Management Organisation and Fisheries Authorities produced this quick guide which outlines some of the distinguishing feature differences between the American and European lobsters as part of an effort to recapture released lobsters with the help of local fishers. This map shows the records of American lobster in Wales as of 2021. Although there are few sightings recorded, there may be others that have not been picked up, highlighting the need for greater monitoring and surveillance in the marine environment. Lastly, we come to the American oyster drill, Eurosalphinx cinerea. This is a horizon species for whales, meaning that it has not yet been reported in Wales, but it may arrive soon and we should be on the lookout for it. It is native to Northern America and is already established in England, having most likely been introduced accidentally with oyster imports. It preys heavily on oysters and other bivalves, drilling small circular holes into their shells and digesting the contents. 
The oyster drill has been seen to prefer preying on smaller, softer shelled oysters as they are easier to drill into. As such, they can decimate stocks of oyster spat. This map shows the records on the NBN atlas of oyster drills, which are in highest densities on the southeast coast of England. As well as wanting to limit and prevent the environmental and economic impacts of INS, we also have a legal responsibility to address INS. This is reflected in UK policy, like the GB Non-Native Species Strategy, which was updated last year, and legislation like the Wildlife and Countryside Act of 1981, under which people can be prosecuted for introducing or spreading INS. An example of legislation in action is the American Lobster release in 2015 that was mentioned earlier. In Brighton, 361 lobsters and 35 Dungeness crabs, which had been bought from local fishmongers, were released from a boat into the sea. The consequence of this was a massive recovery effort, which managed only to recapture 136 in the subsequent months. To date, less than half have been recovered and all life stages have since been found, showing that they are breeding in UK waters. Two individuals responsible for the mass release were fined over £28,000 for breaching the Wildlife and Countryside Act. I'm now going to move on to talk a little bit about biosecurity and share some key biosecurity principles and best practice. Firstly, what is biosecurity? If we look at how a species becomes an INS, it starts in its point of origin, is transported and introduced to a new area. It then establishes in this new area, meaning it settles and breeds, and then it increases its population size and expands its habitat. In the hierarchy of management, there is an action to address each of these stages to try and cut it off. This starts with preventing the transport and introduction of the species in the first place. This is followed by rapid response to address the new introduction when it is detected. If the species has established, we then try to contain the population to prevent it from expanding. If the species has already spread, then we enact population control measures to try to minimise its impacts and hamper further spread. Biosecurity relates mostly to the first stage of the hierarchy of management, i.e. taking actions to prevent the introduction of a species. It can also refer to the actions taken to contain a species once established, i.e. to prevent it spreading to a new area. This diagram from the US National Park Service demonstrates the importance of prevention, early detection and rapid response. As the time increases from the introduction of the species and the more widespread it becomes, the cost of actions increases with long-term management being costly and time consuming. Additionally, eradication is very difficult, especially in the marine environment. So the focus should be on prevention to reduce the risk introduction and spread of INS in the first place. By addressing INS here, we can reduce the risk of impacts to the marine environment and reduce the potential costs to industry. As the old adage goes, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Biosecurity planning involves identifying realistic, pragmatic and cost-effective actions to reduce the risk of introducing or spreading INS or facilitating their establishment. You should identify and assess the pathways that are present and introduce relevant biosecurity actions. If you focus on preventing a specific species, you will address that species only. However, if you focus efforts on reducing the risk from a pathway, you will address all species associated with that pathway. Some actions might be highly specific to the site and the pathways at that site, but there are some general biosecurity measures that will apply across the board. An important first step in biosecurity is to raise awareness among users. This can be done by advertising and promoting existing guidance, for example, the Check Clean Dry campaign and information on the Green Blue, a wing of the Royal Yachting Association. Place visual aids in kit rooms, rest areas and offices to aid familiarity. Free resources such as this are available on the GB Non-Native Species Secretariat website, shown down here. The RYA has also produced video guidance on YouTube for how to check, clean and dry your boats, watercraft and equipment. Some easy wins are simple, good practice measures. For example, where practical, 
Remove man-made structures and equipment from the water when they're not in use. In general, inns prefer artificial structures and removing what you can is an easy to do basic biosecurity measure. This could include temporarily removing items out of the preferred growth zone, for example, removing any movable trestles or other structures like old fenders, warps, keep nets and oyster bags. Another easy win is to air dry what you can, when you can. Most, if not all, marine and aquatic inns are killed by dehydration. Identify opportunities to dry out equipment or infrastructure as often as possible. This could mean setting aside a drying room or area for dive kit, wetsuits, life jackets and other equipment. It can also mean identifying when vessels which are used less frequently, such as barges or dredges, can be hauled out and dry stored. Part of biosecurity is knowing what species you have at your site and keeping an eye out for any new species. This can be done by undertaking surveys to establish a baseline of species and then implementing continual monitoring strategies. Settlement panels, like the one in the left-hand photo, are useful passive monitoring tools that can be put into the water at a site and checked every few months to see what fouling species are present. When carrying out routine inspections around sites, Try to integrate visual inspections of infrastructure and vessel surfaces below the waterline to look out for any fouling that looks out of the ordinary. Encourage staff to photograph and report unusual sightings. Provide staff and visitors with identification guides for key inns. NRW has produced guides in both Welsh and English that are available as both digital and hard copies. Water sport and boating events can present an even greater pathway risk as participants may have brought vessels and equipment from outside the region to take part. At all events, there should be a general increase in biosecurity measures. Biosecurity information and requirements should be sent out with any advanced communication, such as event registration. During high risk events, a short talk or briefing before each event could be given to explain the importance of biosecurity as well as to remind participants to engage with the site biosecurity. Staff or volunteers could be in attendance to raise awareness of INS and assist with any biosecurity actions required. If possible, increase the availability and use of any site biosecurity facilities and equipment at designated cleaning stations. Ensure that participants clean and dry their equipment after taking part. When cleaning boats and equipment, it is important to prevent waste water and waste material from re-entering the sea. The waste material could contain fragments of inns that may be viable if they re-enter the water. This fragmentation could also help disperse them to new areas. Capturing waste material is also good practice to prevent flakes or fragments of anti-fouling paint from entering the water and impacting local species. Wash down facilities that capture waste are shown in the photos here. This system is comprised of a bundled mat and a pump. The waste water is pumped out to be treated and reused and the waste material is swept up, gathered and disposed of appropriately on land. These systems, however, can be a costly investment. Lastly, creating and following a biosecurity plan is an important step. Biosecurity plans are an acknowledgement of the potential risk that an activity could pose on the introduction and spread of marine inns and the biosecurity measures that can be taken to mitigate this risk. Typically, at a minimum, these plans include an introduction which sets out the aims and objectives of the plan. They should include where and to whom the plan applies. A section identifying the risks that the biosecurity plan will cover, for example, a particular pathway. The measures by which the risks will be addressed, which are usually in the form of general or specific actions to be taken at a site. Steps for how the plan will be implemented. And a review process identifying who the plan will be reviewed by and how frequently. Biosecurity plans are not currently a legal requirement, but are seen as good practice. Overall, biosecurity plans must be concise and instructive. They must be both usable and useful. Thank you for listening to our presentation on invasive non-native species and biosecurity. We hope you enjoyed it and have learned about biosecurity planning objectives for Wales. 
The next step in this project is to hold in-person workshops to discuss and agree biosecurity actions going forward for each of the four target SACs. The first of these workshops will be held in the spring of 2024. We hope to see you there. Thank you again and goodbye.